You are now tuning in to the Mind Body Podcast, where fitness experts and life coaches share their secrets on taking your mind and your body to the absolute best. This is the advice you wish you heard years ago. Get ready and take notes as we expose the raw truth behind achieving amazing natural physique and strength and ultimately become a stronger version of yourself. Добро пожаловать, дамы и господа! С вами Лидор Даян! Or in other words, welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to the Mind Body Podcast. I'm your host, Lidor Daian, and in this episode, I interviewed Meno Hanselman from BeijingBodybuilding.com. Meno is an online physique coach, fitness model, and a scientific author. He is one of the leaders of the evidence-based fitness movement. As you will see, he knows what he talks about. So, without further ado, let's begin the interview. Hello, Meno. How is it going? It's great. Yeah. How are you doing? Very, very well. Uh, thank you for being in my podcast. I'm really honored. And uh, I would like to in- start uh, with a little bit of your background, your story. So tell us a little bit about your personal story and how uh, your fitness journey began. Okay, sure. My uh, story, I guess, is that I uh, started off working as a business consultant, um, which is also what my uh, main education was in, economics, statistics, uh, and sciences. And I th- applied... Uh, advanced physical data analysis uh, during my job as a consultant, but I found that it was more the career path that was expected of me and you know, the prestigious thing to do and not really uh, what, what had always been my passion, which is uh, fitness, exercise, science, and nutrition. And so I started for myself and I developed over time the patient bodybuilding method and it quickly grew from there and now we're um, an eight person company, not including um, administrative people, and uh, it's going really well. I uh, do a lot of coaching, uh, practically full-time, and I host uh, the patient personal training certification program, uh, which is an online certification program that basically uh, provides an alternative to the more, you know, do you even lift kind of mainstream Mm -hmm. uh, programs that are out there. And when you just began and... uh you convert the consulting to actually be and take uh, the fitness into a career. So what was in your mind? Like, uh, is it good? Uh, am I going to do it? Like, was was uh, any doubts in your mind? Oh, yeah, there were, it was a very gradual process. There's this uh, idea that uh, people have, you know, they sort of got this fantasy about what it's like to be uh, PT or whatever they want to be, musician or whatever their dream is, and then one day you just quit their job and start working on their new thing. You know that mm-hmm. that wasn't at all how it was. It was a gradual process that occurred over uh, basically well, more than a full year, uh, if I remember correctly. And I I did a lot of research on what made people happy, um, and one of those aspects was. Um, asking yourself, myself, what uh, you think about your life if you're on your deathbed, if you have any regrets, and that was a particularly strong thing for me to do, um, or strong incentive for me, because um, it was very clear to me that if I continued on that career path until you know retirement, uh, I would not be satisfied with my life. I'm pretty sure. I was already pretty sure of that, and so I, I sought to change it, and I did that very gradually. Uh, the startup also was not like I just quit my job and then started the new thing. No, at some point I just had two full-time gigs. I uh, was already writing for T-Nation uh, when I was still um, at least part-time working as a business consultant. I tapered off the amount of uh, clients that I had that I did consultancy for. And um, did more and more personal training. So, you know, my own people uh, were enjoying lunch time. I was emailing clients. And uh, at home, when I came home at night, uh, also I was emailing clients. So, it was very, um, very, very uh, 
busy, hectic. And over time, I was confident that um, I could quit my job. And um, it's actually that I also started traveling then. And, um, Cause I'm a, a digital nomad, I don't have any home anywhere. We just, uh, my girlfriend and I, we travel everywhere. Mm -hmm. As long as we have good quality internet and there are gyms available and supermarkets, then um, we want to explore that place. So we're, we're traveling all over. Uh, but one of the reasons I originally started traveling actually uh, was not just because it's, I think it's awesome, but also um, because you can move to areas with a very low cost of living so that um, we ba were basically set on um, being insured, sort of, that even if our whole uh, coaching thing, because uh, my girlfriend actually made the same career switch, um, also went into fitness and started her own company. And we were confident then that, you know, even if it was sort of a failure and it would just be kind of a world trip and then a year later we, we could always go back to our uh, original careers. Nice. Tell us a little bit about the, the, the consulting, like it, many people like say, uh, uh, I, I can do online, I, I need somebody in person so I can, uh, uh, it can like uh, measure me and uh, do a one-on-one -on -one training with me. So what it really takes to really make it in online business because many people are skeptical with, these days. Yeah, it's definitely, it's not for everyone. And there are people that simply are not potential clients because you do online coaching and they want um, a physical trainer. But I quickly found my niche in uh, evidence-based fitness that I target the people like myself, basically, that were very serious about their strength training or no longer novices. I do coach novices, but it's um, absolutely not the main um, my average clients basically so um, you have to make it work and you have to learn how to interpret emails and solve things and very much uh, become an expert in uh, looking at data yeah, at least that's how I do it you can also have a, a more personal approach to Skype sessions and stuff with clients that I don't do Skype with most of my clients just email but you have to look at data patterns for example looking at uh, certain exercises and compare the strength ratios mm -hmm. and then you can often get a very good idea about uh, how someone's technique is and then with video analysis for example you can um, get most of the same benefits you have with uh, physical training and uh, the plus side of that if someone were to hire me for the same amount of time that I uh, am available to my online clients it would be not affordable for uh, anyone but a tiny portion of the market so uh, it's the kind of clients I like they're a bit more advanced very serious don't need you know uh, their hands held all the time and um, it also fits my uh, my style of thinking and uh, my personality and we're, when we're looking at uh, a fat loss like many people want to, to really uh, lose uh, body fat and get into tone and shredded body uh, so, what is it like uh, the mentality of fat loss? Like, how can you overcome unnecessary food addiction or overeating? Because many people, uh, like when they they just start a cut, it's really really difficult to them like to stay consistent and they overeat. So, how can you really switch that in your mind and really be okay? Now I, I'm going to to eat less. Yeah, that, that's a very broad topic. Uh, dieting psychology is um, something I was one of the few areas where I can actually apply many of the things I learned at college because uh, I practically have a psychology degree, uh, behavioral psychology, even though more even more specifically aimed at weight loss. And that's an area where a lot of people think uh, that are um, familiar with exercise science and nutritional sciences, and they can readily see that science is applicable in those areas, but they don't see that in more, you know, fuzzy fields like psychology. You also have scientific research, and there is actually a lot of um, great wealth of literature on kind of behavioral changes um, to make and how you can make people act in certain ways uh, that are more or less successful. So, 
Uh, one thing that I personally really like as an overall kind of mindset is that I think of dieting as exchanging foods for leanness. So as I progress in a diet, the leaner I get, the more foods I exchange and the leaner I can become. Because you can, you can still eat those foods and that's the whole if it fits your macros mindset. Mm -hmm. uh, basically, it, you can eat whatever you want as long as you fill your macros. But it doesn't work for most people at least. So the math simply doesn't add up. If you eat a big portion of ice cream and you're in contest prep, then you are often going to be hungry no matter what you eat for the rest of the day. So uh, you can do it, but it's often simply not worth it. And it tends to result in, um, in bad scenarios. The, most common of which is hunger. A lot of people have this idea that dieting should be accompanied uh, with hunger, like it's a normal thing, being regularly hungry. Uh, but then I always ask my clients, you know, this is not something you do once and then uh, you're done and you're gonna bulk at, you know, double the energy intake again. You should think about how are you going to keep this up, not just for months, but for life, because most people, you know, they're interested uh, at least the non-competitors, when you're not in contest prep, you're interested in maintaining six-pack abs or a cellulite-free body, mm -hmm. not just for the summer months, but year-round. And that's with cardio and being hungry. If you ask them, you know, do you plan on keeping this up for not just a few weeks or a few months, but years? And then it's, you know, people quickly realize that being hungry or doing two hours of cardio a day to get to that leaner weight are just non-sustainable diet practices. Yes, and uh, many people like just do crash diet and going too many, too much low in uh, their calories, and they put in themselves in so many deficits. And the the funny thing is that uh, it, uh, today's world, we all know this is not something that's good to do, but still people are doing this because it's that mentality that okay, if I do more or uh, if I push myself harder then I will see uh, quicker results, right? Yeah, exactly. And the funny thing is, the, word, the whole word diet, as exactly as you say, has become associated with this short period where you sort of throw your life around and you suffer. And then as a, as, a, um, you know, as a result of your sacrifice, you gain the body you want, at least you know, for a certain period. Mm -hmm. But... Originally, the, the word diet comes, it came from the Greek, uh, if you look at the, the etymology of the word, and it actually meant, uh, I think it's diaita is how you pronounce it, it actually meant uh, way of life. So the whole word diet uh, has never originally had the connotation that it now has. Uh, it basically meant the same as lifestyle. Although, ironically, then the, the coaches that sort of got that and now call themselves lifestyle coaches, are often the you know the non absolutely not evidence based kind of coaches uh, that are um, really kind of more fuzzy and focused on the uh, uh, the total science. Um, if we talk about stress, so uh, a lot of people like are very stressful and uh, the stress make them eat more or their cortisol levels are much higher than what it needs to be. So how can you really control it if we're looking at uh, the natural uh, things to do? Like I don't want to take pills or something that uh, will call me. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and stress, manages, stress management is actually a pretty important part, I think, of coaching that's really uh, underrated. Actually, I have extensive uh, guides on stress management that I send to my clients who have trouble with this because uh, many people think this, you know, nutrition, exercise, those are key, and, you know, stress, maybe it matters, but probably they don't really believe it. But if you look at the research, uh, we can actually find that uh, types of stress, even just uh, work-related stress or acute psychological stress, they can cut your recovery capacity from a workout in half. Well, it literally takes twice as long to recover from a hard squat session, for example, if you are experiencing a psychological stress. So say um, you have morning workouts, you do every squat workout, and that day at the office is really stressful, not just, um, or purely psych psychologically, right? There's not, not any physically, nothing physically is demanded of you. It's just that uh, your boss is whining at you and you have 
performance review and it didn't go well, and you have a deadline coming up, that kind of stuff. So that actually doubles your recovery capacity need compared to normal. And we also have some research that I think it hasn't been published yet, um, but that shows that um, in students, higher academic stress periods are associated with reduced strength development and reduced muscle growth. So it's actually a very important topic. Um, and one of the big things I'd say in terms of stress is that you want to tackle your problems. And in the psychology, this is called um, the difference between active and passive coping, and sometimes called uh, avoidant or facing coping. And a lot of people sort of shy away from their problems, or they result to something like uh, their diet to eat a lot or make themselves happier in some other way. Um, but it's a band-aid approach. It doesn't really take care of the problem, and as a result, um, it's a very temporary solution. So one of the most important things that sounds really simple and it's really easy to say, but it's actually for a lot of people very difficult to implement, is that you actually have to solve your problems. So this whole idea of stress management or um, you know these fancy things about how you cope with it, I think the solution is often that you don't want to really cope with it or manage it, you want to just solve the problem. That's one of the first things to do. Mm -hmm. um, uh, another thing, especially in our current society, is that um, you want to have periods in your life where you have low and high stress, because that's the natural state of, uh, or at least the state that we evolved in, that kind of environment. So, so what you see in animals and elite athletes, they tend to cope with stress better in the sense that they have high stress peaks, but then afterwards, uh, they have very low cortisol levels and don't experience much stress anymore. So uh, this is also useful if you combine it with what I just said, facing the problem head on, because that stress is actually a very good thing. Um, and for fat loss, in principle, psycho the effects of cortisol are actually beneficial because it mobilizes energy. Cortisol uh, makes you aroused and active and um, actually increases fat oxidation and mobilizes fuel. So it's not um, something that should make you fat. It's only when cortisol becomes chronically elevated that it actually tends to reverse in function and becomes detrimental to um, your weight loss by reducing energy expenditure and impairing nutrient partitioning. And when talking about uh, gaining muscle, does uh, stress uh, can affect it? Yes, absolutely. That's um, like the research I just mentioned. And I think there are two studies, um, I think one of them has been published and the other one hasn't yet, that show that it actually impairs muscle growth long term. And it also makes a lot of sense because if you're not recovering as well, and you can have the same uh, performance during your workouts, then that will indirectly also hamper muscle growth. When we're talking about muscle, muscle imbalance, so many people have like uh, small calves or uh, small shoulders or chest, so does that really a genetic thing or you can overcome genetic and really uh, and make a difference in your small uh, muscles and actually gain more muscle there? Yeah, there is definitely a genetic component, but it's absolutely not the case that you can't do anything about it. In terms of uh, muscle balance, the first thing uh, when a client says, for example, I have to develop biceps or, you know, Effects or whatever. The first thing you want to do is you want to objectively assess if it really is a muscle imbalance or if it's just the client's perception of muscle balance. Because uh, often the case is actually not that people really have that kind of muscle imbalance. Mm -hmm. For example, guys often think that their arms are small yes. or their chest is small, but you almost never hear guys say, you know, I have underdeveloped traps or mm -hmm. underdeveloped glutes or hamstrings. Mm -hmm. Even though uh, that is actually a lot more often the case, especially in people that are on a more typical bro program, they really neglect uh, the posterior chain muscle groups and they overemphasize biceps and pecs. And those are also the muscle groups they've been training for the longest period. So uh, the first thing you want to do is objectively assess this. And what I do is I uh, build a calculator that is based on the work of 
uh, what it's called is the guy that published the research on uh, predicting your maximum muscular potential. Mm -hmm. But Casey Butt, that's his name. And uh, he also had uh, ratios that he looked at in elite natural athletes over time, also from the pre steroid era, so it's not confounded by uh, steroid use. And um, you can use those ratios. I also published some of them in my article about uh, three reasons your calves aren't growing because the calves are really notorious body part in this sense. Um, that you, have to, you can look at these ratios and you can calculate relative development scores. So you can, for example, see, uh, like in the calf article, I talk about um, elite athletes, generally at the advanced level, having equal ratios, roughly, uh, between their circumference of the neck, the wrists, uh, or the neck, the arms, and the calves, not the wrists. Mm -hmm. So um, if you notice that, for example, your arms are a lot smaller than your calves, then yes, you probably have the developed arms, uh, at least as a guy, because uh, the ratios are different for women. Mm -hmm. So uh, then you have good reason to actually target that body part more. And one of the things um, that is most important, I think, in targeting underdeveloped body parts is prioritizing them in your exercise sessions. For example, for the calves, uh, a lot of people say, oh, my calves never grow no matter what I do. Mm -hmm. But they always do the calf workouts as sort of an afterthought after their yes. uh, last leg work, for example. So. They're, on the one hand, they're complaining about their calves not growing. On the other hand, they're never really prioritizing their calves because they're they're stuck in this idea that uh, you know you have to start your workouts with heavy compound work, and only then can you move to isolation work. Mm -hmm. So exercise priority is really important to target the developed body parts. And what do you think about like uh, supersetting and drop setting and all of this kind of technique? Like uh, does this all of this as a, any place in a, a good uh, program? Uh, it, they definitely can, uh, but they're very different. Uh, for example, supersets, it also depends on the type of supersets. The main benefit is simply that it saves time. Mm -hmm. um, so you're doing two exercises back to back without any rest. Uh, the problem is that often when you do this in like serious trainees that have uh, several years of strength experience that are actually strong, then work capacity suffers. And we don't really see this in the research, but it's just so obvious if you actually lift. In some research, they've actually found that stringing together leg presses and squats, for example, does not uh, negatively affect work capacity. So they're actually saying that if you're doing squats right after leg presses, you can do just as many reps as if you do the squats first. Mm -hmm. which is just ridiculous if, you know, you actually left. Yeah, so, um, in more advanced lifters, I generally like what I call paired sets, which are basically supersets, but you allow rest between them. So you do alternate between exercises, kind of like circuit training, but you don't do them back to back. The only exception uh, where I do like supersets is antagonist supersets, because those are actually beneficial to increase work capacity. For example, if you pair together uh, bench presses and bench rows, mm -hmm. which are opposing muscle uh, movement patterns, then you generally find that you have increased muscle activation levels and increased repetition performance during the rows because uh, the antagonists during the rows, which in this case are the packs, for example, uh, they are fatigued and they don't, um, by a mechanism that is still largely unknown, they don't limit the performance of the uh, lats and even the biceps as much, which is very interesting because it's, it's not just restricted to uh, the actually opposing uh, muscle groups. It's the whole exercise that benefits from it. And uh, uh, when we're talking about like a maximum uh, potential naturally, because uh, as we all uh, like, uh, when we, the more we lift and the more we train, so it's really harder for us to, to actually gain more muscles. So how can we really know that, okay, that's it, I got to my maximum potential and I can no longer gain more muscle. Is that possible to like stop gaining any muscle? Um, that's a really good question, actually. It's commonly um, hypothesized, is the right word, that there is something like a netting max, right? A natural muscular potential. And there are some 
formulas and research that seem to indicate this, but uh, like the KC Bud formulas, I reference those on my website as well, so uh, you can check that out. Most people find that very interesting to see, you know, what their maximum muscular potential is. Mm -hmm. But um, you cannot ever really know, and this is also something I personally um, have struggled with for a long time, in that um, I, to the best of my measurements, uh, I think it was a year, two years ago now, I did everything possible to get the absolute best measurements two years in a row for two weeks straight, having the same kind of um, fluid balance, same carbohydrate intake, being at the exact same uh, levels of various skin folds, for example. And then I concluded, uh, based on those measurements, that over that year, I had gained one pound of muscle mass. Mm. So In one year? Yeah, so that's, depending on your perspective, that's either terrible or yeah. really good. It but sucks. I was really happy with it. <laughs> but uh, yeah, if, if you're training a lot of time, so uh, it's, it's good. Yeah, so I, I expected zero, basically, because I thought at that time I was at my natural muscular potential, mm -hmm. uh, which is why I did the tests. Uh, but I still grew, and I have not the kind of testing since. Uh, but I think I've, I've progressed a little bit. Like, uh, at least in strength, I've set some PRs and different exercises, and I think I appear a little bit bigger. At least um, I may I manage to retain a bit more muscle mass when I diet to photo shoot or stage condition. So um, I think I'm making a bit more progress, but it's hard to say. It comes really, really hard to say. You're really looking at years when you've got an elite level trainee. But the thing is, the only way to find out is to try. So. A lot of people struggle with this, and I think the best scenario really is not to think about this because it's, it's really demotivational. Yes. And I, I personally, uh, especially in the same with going to the gym, you don't want to think about whether you should go to the gym every time, every day. Mm -hmm. uh, you should just go and make it a routine, fit it into your lifestyle. You've decided that this is a lifestyle that is good for you on many ways, you know, going to the gym. Uh, makes you happier, it improves cognitive functioning, uh, you can eat more, um, most people feel better after their workouts, or at least uh, an hour or so after, after they have uh, rested a bit. So it's good to do, but you're not always motivated at that time, and I, I think it's best not to think about these things uh, too much and just just do it, as Nike says. Mm -hmm. and, do it, and when you're still trying to like gain muscle, like uh, there are some people that okay I am um, I uh, just finished the cut and I'm like seven or eight percent body fat and now that I'm uh, starting to gain more uh, uh, muscle and uh, I gain weight so if like let's just say in uh, one or two weeks I screw things up and I gain like uh, two or three pounds so what I I need to do like again a little bit of cut and then again uh, another like uh, a calorie surplus and again calorie deficit so how can I balance it? Yeah you can do various things uh, but generally when uh, clients uh, mess up basically they, they lose control mm -hmm. or they deliberately have cheat days um, or go on holiday for example and are yes. deliberately lenient they gain some fat uh, whatever the scenario what I, what I often recommend if, if the goal is still fat loss afterwards and usually it is or it even becomes fat loss, because after some fat gain, people are usually extra motivated to lose fat, uh, because it seems like they gain a lot of fat, even though you know, it's maybe it's just 2% body fat, mm -hmm. um, which they were actually still very much leaner than they were at the start of the cut. Uh, but anyway, people are motivated, so I generally recommend just getting back to your routine and following the same program, just continuing as if nothing happened. You can make some adjustments uh, and you should tweak the diet a bit because their metabolism often will have changed, the energy expenditure may be a bit higher, for example. Mm -hmm. uh, but, you know, those are, that's fine tuning. And in big picture mindset, I like people to just go back into their routine and keep progressing because the whole reason that um, they messed up often is because they didn't have a good routine or a sustainable program that they were working on. So if you start making all these adjustments and you 
uh, keep changing things even though uh, they were working, then, or at least that part of the program was working, that actually prevents people from forming the right habits, uh, building a good routine, and getting into a program that is sustainable for them. So, but uh, if, if we look at the uh, like changing. Uh, uh, exercise selection is it okay to change every like four or eight weeks because many people just get bored like ah oh, I, I can't do like squats and bench or uh, deadlift every every single week I I, I gotta switch things up mm -hmm. yeah the, you can definitely switch things up purely for psychological reasons so, sometimes people just get bored with an exercise mm -hmm. you know that's a good reason as any because if people are not motivated to do the exercise and give uh, give it all they got, then that in, in itself will limit progress. So then it might actually be physiologically optimal as well to change the exercise. Uh, but in terms of just changing exercises, I'm not a fan at all of uh, doing this at arbitrary time. So this, you know, the, the rule of every four weeks you change your exercises or every eight weeks. Mm -hmm. I don't have any such rule. Um, for example, if someone's making great progression on their squat, and they love doing their squats. I see no reason why at four weeks into the program you should just switch it up just because. You should milk that progress and make sure that they continue progressing on it. I think um, exercise switching too often is actually one way why uh, personal trainers and clients, personal trainers uh, sometimes deliberately, but clients often uh, and intentionally, they fake their own progress because. You know, they as soon as things get hard in the program, they switch it, and then when they come back to it later, they find that they plateau at the same uh, reps and weight for the squat, for example. So they don't really make any long-term progress, and I think that uh, the kind of program hopping can be really detrimental. So you have to be more strategic with the uh, changes you make, not just for exercise selection. This actually goes for almost all kind of uh, program changes. I also wanted to ask you about uh, what's your take on uh, intermediate fasting because lately in the past two or three years I believe uh, there was a lot of uh, the talk about uh, intermediate fasting that uh, our fasting uh, can really uh, help us uh, with our uh, uh, function. Does intermediate fasting get any benefits in fat loss or gaining muscle? I think intermittent fasting, um, often it doesn't really convey any special benefits. It's just um, a tool you have in your toolbox, basically. And for some people, uh, like research shows that people with certain personality traits tend to uh, find intermittent fasting diets more sustainable, whereas other people, uh, for example, one such personality trait is compulsivity. People are compulsive. They often don't do well on intermittent fasting programs, and they do better uh, with a higher meal frequency and having uh, breakfast um, soon after awakening. There are also a few um, possible downsides in scenarios where intermittent fasting is not recommended. Um, one of which is, which I, I think is kind of obvious, but it's still quite, quite controversial. Um, I'm not a fan of faster training at all. Um, research uh, also favors this that you cannot maximize protein balance. Uh, if you train completely fasted, and especially now if you train uh, fasted in the morning, for example, and then you only start eating uh, later in the day, so at 4 p.m. or so, so, if you train right during your um, fasting window. Uh, there's also some indications that uh, people with insulin resistance, especially overweight individuals and obese individuals, actually lose more fat if they have uh, an early breakfast. Um, of course, this doesn't mean, mean you can do intermittent fasting because, um, you know, Martin Burkham popularized the term intermittent fasting and then therefore people associated with lean gains intermittent fasting, which is basically uh, skipping breakfast consistently. That's really all it comes down to. But you can also do it with fasting later in the day, which uh, researchers then call um, time-restricted hmm. energy restriction or something like that. Uh, depending on the study you look at. So most people have actually practice some form of intermittent fasting uh, already. For example, uh, a common scenario that I um, 
uh, give him my PT course if you've got an individual that has their dinner at 6 p.m. at night and um, uh, they wake up the next day and they have their breakfast at 8 a.m. That's sort of a normal scenario, most people would say. But if you have another individual that has their last meal directly before going to bed at 12 o'clock and then they have their next meal only at 12 um, at lunchtime, then that person is actually fasting for only 12 hours compared to 14 hours for the average person. So the average person with the dinner at 6 and breakfast at 8 actually does intermittent fasting for two hours longer than the person that did the intermittent morning fasting. So you really want to look at the objective uh, time uh, when they're fasting and how long they're fasting and not just you know if they're skipping breakfast or not because uh, by definition the word breakfast means breaking the fast so mm -hmm. everyone has breakfast just at different times technically speaking. But how, how many, how much hours do you actually need in, in order to be in that fasting zone? Like, it does six or eight hours it's uh, enough, or you need to be like 10, 12? Mm -hmm. It depends on uh, your last meal uh, and what you really mean by the, the fasted condition, because there, um, most of the benefits of being in that fasted state um, are actually not really benefits, and there's definitely a point where you're overdoing it. Some research shows, for example, that mTOR, which is a form of uh, anabolic signaling, basically uh, um, a message that your body sends to um, initiate muscle growth, to start up the process muscle growth, uh, tends to decrease at about 20 hours into a fast. So that's an indication that it may not be optimal to fast that long. Uh, probably, I'm not a fan generally of fasting that long anyway. Um, but in terms of what you'd consider fasting, it really depends on your last meal um, that you had because that will determine how long you still have elevated levels of um, fatty acids in the blood, um, still have elevated blood glucose levels, hyperaminoacidemia. Um, as a general rule, uh, I think some medical practices, they give the rule that two hours after a meal, uh, you're in the fasted zone, but you're definitely not in the true uh, zone because it's still kind of postprandial if you look at things like fatty acid elevations. Um, and I'd say that most people you're looking at at least six hours after the meal or you're really in the fasted state and uh, blood levels um, for all nutrients have returned to baseline. But and uh, like for myself, when I uh started the intermediate fasting and I tried on myself, I saw that like uh, I was more focused during the day, like I, I was not tired, but uh, on the other end when I like went to the gym and I trained fasted or something like that, then I was super weak and uh, I was overeating when I eat my meals because I eat like two or three meals, so I overeat. So I think it depends on, on the person no? Yeah, definitely. So, like I said, some people just uh, psychologically react a lot better to it than others. And um, same for the energy level during the day. Because what you say, a lot of people actually experience that, myself included. Mm -hmm. I am more productive early in the mornings uh, when I have to work and I'm fasted. If I have a large meal, uh, I get what the research is called um, postprandial somnolence which basically means becoming sleepy after having consumed a meal. Mm -hmm. So uh, there's this idea that you know you consume food and food contains energy, and therefore you also get more mental energy, but it's just an unfortunate uh, thing in the English language that we use the word energy to um, refer both to cognitive functioning, so how well your mind functions, and to physical energy, which is just you know, calories in the nutritional sciences. So often you actually find that people after a meal, especially very large meals, they become more tired compared to before. Yes. So this, this idea of um, food giving you energy often doesn't really work in practice. Yeah, because your body is up, uh, absorbing a lot of uh, food, so it gets you tired, no? Yeah, basically the, the central nervous system goes into a rest and digest mode called parasympathetic dominance mm -hmm. compared to sympathetic dominance, which is for kind of fight or flight mode. So 
after you've eaten, the body is indeed it's digesting nutrients and it wants you to just calm down, relax, sit down, you've eaten, you're nourished, you don't have to do anything. Compared to if you're fasting, then you actually, from an evolutionary point of view, have to be motivated you know, to go find food. So you have to be active. In the fitness industry, there are so many supplements. You need protein, you need uh, multivitamin, vitamin C, fish oils, and so many stuff. So how can the, the regular person who is just uh, maybe uh, six months or one year or maybe even more, how can you really know what supplements does he really need to take? Yeah, this um, that's a good question. I think there's no such thing as a supplement you need to take. Um, like in my PT course, I intentionally I categorize supplements, um, which is a really long list in terms of their potential uses and how often I recommend them. I intentionally have a blank page for uh, the category supplements you should always take mm -hmm. because there's no such thing. Certain supplements are useful in certain situations for certain people. There's no such thing as a supplement everyone should be taking. Um, unfortunately, that kind of magic pill simply hasn't been found yet in contrast to what you know the supplement industry will have you believe. Um, there's, there's really no such thing as an essential supplement. Uh, but some supplements that are really useful, um, I do um, often stress the importance of micronutrition. I think it's highly underrated. Uh, vitamin D levels, for example, Certain people can be deficient in, depending on where you live on the planet and your skin color. Mm -hmm. And then if you're deficient in vitamin D, then it can actually increase strength. And I think muscle growth as well. I'm not sure if there's a direct study on that. Uh, I think only meta-analytic work. But uh, magnesium, same story, can increase testosterone levels, strength development. Uh, zinc has been found to um, have a significant effect actually on your energy expenditure if you are deficient in it. So you don't need to megadose any of those things, but you do need to ensure that you're not deficient. So you want to look at the diet, uh, and especially if you're on a more extreme kind of diet, if you're really low carb or really low fat or vegetarian or ketogenic, those diets tend to have um, be more prone towards being deficient in certain nutrients, and then you want to supplement those. But if your diet is really good all around uh, whole foods and you're covered for all nutrients, then you don't need to supplement them. Uh, creatine. Monohydrates uh, has been proven to be very uh, effective and basically being a, as good as it gets kind of supplement for many people, um, but not everyone is a responder. So there's actually a responder continuum. Some people don't respond to it at all because their body already produces enough uh, creatine itself. So there's no point in supplementing for them either. Um, I personally take melatonin because I actually have insomnia and um, my body doesn't produce enough of it itself, but if I supplement it, I have no trouble um, becoming sleepy at night and sleeping well. So, but again, other people don't need to take this if they have no trouble falling asleep. Caffeine is one that um, is beneficial for a lot of people, although it's um, often abused. If you use too much of it, you lose the effect, so you have to use it strategically. Um, and again, it's not as effective as many people think because most of the most of the effects are psychological. So it seems more effective than it really is. It doesn't really um, work wonders um, for your performance. It just feels that way. Um, mm -hmm. Fish oil can be really useful depending on the omega-3 content of the diet um, and the type of fish oil because actually a lot of fish oil supplements have gone rancid. Uh, they don't contain nearly the amount of omega-3 on the label and um, because the omega-3 acids are not readily bioavailable because they're in a poor form, they have been uh, esterified, for example, uh, and they've gone rancid, then they're actually doing more harm than good by creating rather than decreasing your inflammation levels. Um, I think that's it for the supplements that are um, for almost everyone at least consider worth considering. And then you have lots of supplements that have kind of niche rules and stimulants that some people like to take, but again, none of them are essential. Mm -hmm. And uh, the last que questions that I wanted to ask you, uh, that I ask a lot of people, is what would be the legacy uh, that you would like to live after uh, you would no longer be in this world? 
because many of us uh, want to leave something more after than uh, we will be here, right? So what will be your legacy? I guess the first thing uh, to think about then would be uh, children, but I don't have any children yet. I'm not planning on having anyone soon either because uh, it, it doesn't fit my traveling lifestyle and there's no rush. Mm -hmm. So uh, in this case, I'm actually going to go with uh, Bayesian bodybuilding, um, the, the method I created and creating that more, um, making that a company is what I'm basically doing now that um, at least in theory should still be able to function after I'm gone. So ideally, um, it would still work. There would be a team behind it, still publishing articles. The PT course would still remain a certification program that people uh, can do, and it will become something that it will become the industry standard. For example, um, website should stay up. Should be new content, and I think that would be nice. Mm -hmm. Although you know, when I'm dead, I, I don't really care anymore. I guess, mm -hmm. but I think it's good to think about the, um, uh, the company that way. So, so where can we find you uh, in social media and uh, your website? Sure, yeah. Uh, my website is BajanBodybuilding.com, uh, ManuelHanselmans.com. My name will also get you there. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram. Actually, we, we just uh, sort of launched pretty much every social media channel uh, we can think of. So we're trying uh, what's popular and we're going to be there. As well, um, you can probably find the links on your page. So I recommend you um, get to Leaders page if you're interested, and you can have a look. That's awesome, man! Thank you very much for your time. Uh, I really appreciate it. Uh, I believe uh, a lot of people will take uh, some notes, and because you you brought us a lot of value in this uh, interview, so I really thank you very much for your time. My pleasure. Nice talking to you. Bye bye. See you. If you enjoyed this interview or any other one from the Mind Body podcast, feel free to subscribe to my podcast at iTunes, SoundCloud, and at my YouTube channel. Also, feel free to share or leave a message at the comments below because your opinion is really important to me. Just like I always say, leaders create leaders, and we all here to grow together. For more information about fat loss, gaining muscle, and taking your mind to one new level, check my site at www.lidodayan.com. Till then, never, ever forget to smile. See you soon.